This is the Veterans History Project. My name is Margaret Lacey, and uh, Mr. Howard Howell is speaking to us on this tape. Thank you, Mr. Howell. Thank you, Margaret. Well, we will can go back to the beginning. Where were you drafted, or did you enlist? Um, in uh, in the winter of uh, 1943, the Army and Air Force Reserves were called up. And uh, uh, not being one of either of those, I went up to uh, Richmond from the College of William Mary and took extensive testing with the hoping to qualify for the, uh, the Navy's V-12 program, uh, which was an officer development program. and. Um, I passed everything, but I flunked the physical, and uh, they uh, informed me that I was uh, qualified for the Army's A-12 program, which became known as ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. Um, and <clears throat> I elected to wait to be drafted in August of 43, and I was sent uh, immediately to uh, Fort Benning in uh, Georgia where the uh, infantry and paratroop training took place. And uh, we were then tested again uh, to see if we still qualified. And I was sent back to Johns Hopkins University in an engineering program. Unfortunately, I only lasted a semester because the whole program was, was terminated uh, because of the need for riflemen. So uh, 3,000 of the 110,000 of us in colleges and universities who were also with the V-12, the Navy program, and the Air Force program in schools, we were sent back to, as fillers to infantry outfits. And um, I was with quite a group. Uh, Henry Kissinger was in our group of 3,000. Steve Forbes was a staff sergeant with me in the in the 3rd Battalion of the 84th Infantry Division. There were all these fellows that had qualified. We had to have a pretty good score on the testing. And they'd, so uh, and then we were, we were trained vigorously in Louisiana at Camp Claiborne from about April until um, August. Uh, that included a month of, uh, of glider training Mr. Eisenhower had insisted that any infantry divisions coming over after that, after the after the D-Day, have glider training in case they needed troops to go in that way. And so uh, that's about it. Uh, where did where shipped? I guess that'd be the word. Where did you go from there? Well, we were <clears throat> shipped from um, Camp Claiborne, Louisiana to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, and then over to uh, a glider base at Newbury, England, uh, and then subsequently to another base at, uh, at the name I won't remember, Andover, Andover, England. And subsequently, we were sent to, uh, to Omaha Beach, uh, uh, you know, months. Uh, this would have been uh, now, we're, we're in 1944. And we're, so this would have been, would have been let's see, June, July, August, September, four months after D-Day. But uh, we had the somewhat dubious pleasure of going in just as if we were on a, a D-Day assault. We went on, in on LCIs and climbed down the side of the ship and jumped into smaller boats and went up on the beach. And it was still active. There were mines still shown, you know, as Octoon Minin. You had to be very careful. And we, uh, we then proceeded to uh, follow Mr. Patton across Europe, or across France, and were housed in, uh, our whole division was housed near Gulpen, G-U-L-P-E-N, the Netherlands. We were actually in a town called uh, Gelen, uh, G-E-L-E-E-N. Uh, and they put my company in a Carmelite monastery and hid us, waiting for this next big attack, which was in, in the middle of November. Um, and uh, the, by the way, the young 
a young monk, these were Carmelite monks, the young monk that I befriended while I was there, uh, I went to Mass every morning uh, with him. It was the, the little chapel was right there. Um, I have been in touch with since. He was uh, spirited out of the country because he was in the inter underground. And uh, I t had some difficulty finding him um, after the war and learned that he had gone to, to Kansas um, and changed his name. And um, uh, I still carry a uh, Groten und Hallen, which is a, a souvenir that he gave me. And uh, fairly recently, I'd say about six years ago, I found him again. He's now back in Killeen and uh, he's had a stroke, but he, and he didn't remember me. He remembered the incident, but we had a lovely Sunday afternoon together after mass at a local church. And he, he was very, uh, very thoughtful about the circumstances in those days and his role and our role and, um, and, you know, blessed me and said he was, he said he was, uh, he was sure that I was uh, one of the lucky ones, you know, that, so that was it. Too, wasn't he? Yes. So after we, do you want me to uh, go on with the chronology? Not necessarily. No, all right. You want to get to something that, yeah. Well, the chronology probably fits and then we could circle back to some incidents that, if that's all right. Uh, we, uh, on the, in the middle of November, we, uh, we attacked uh, Geilenkirchen, Germany. And there's a marvelous book on that written by a man by the name of Ken Ford uh, called The um, Assault on Germany, The Battle for Geilenkirchen, which is spelled G-E-I-L-E-N-K-I-R-C-H-E-N. -E -E it was a railway center about 12 miles north of Aachen. And... Um, we took that in a couple of days, and then we ran into a lot of trouble because we were on the German border. And there were pillboxes and mines uh, everywhere. Shoe mines that burst under your feet, and big mines for the tanks. And um, we, I was with an, what they now call an assault company, and we made a night attack after several unsuccessful attacks during the day and uh, reached a little little farm village called Mullendorf. That's M-U-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. And uh, we lost a lot of people and, uh, in various ways. Uh, wounded, some killed, and a number of us were captured because we'd, we'd gotten out ahead of our tanks. Tanks get, couldn't get through the mines. And the German... Uh, uh, 10th Regiment of the 9th Panzer Division, which was an experienced group of soldiers from Russia who had also fought in Holland in, during Operation Market Garden. Very experienced, but also a lot of young people like me. So I suddenly found myself in a wine cellar in an old farm courtyard. Couldn't get out because he, they had the only way out blocked with a, um, a vehicle. And um, it, it was not a tank, it was a, uh, like a personnel carrier with a 20 millimeter gun on it. And that gun had already killed our company commander and the radio man. And I got my first wound there, uh, very minor, but it hurt like the dickens. It was a hot piece of metal that bounced off a wall and hit me on the front of my shin. And... Um, so I, we, we found ourselves captured, and uh, I'd like to come back to that because the soldier who captured me under those rather unusual circumstances is now a personal friend. And uh, I'm, I'd like to tell you that story. Could you walk? Oh, yeah. It was, it was like somebody hit me in the leg with a baseball bat. And there were men around me that were, you know, one man, uh, we, when we got into prison camp, he had a hole through his chest. And it was, you know, it just deflated his young, lung, didn't hit anything that, serious. Or he, he, so there were a lot of fellows in different stages of capture. So we were, they marched us to, uh, in the middle of the night, under both German and American shell fire, because there was some confusion about who had taken this area. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, it was it was bad enough so that they, uh, the soldier who captured me pushed me into a house and we sat under a beautiful German dining table for about 25 minutes. Uh, during the time of which I, I tried to convince him to, to come with me and because uh, uh, the I figured the war was about over. Well, they took us to Broccoline, which is B-R-A-C-H-E-L-E-N, about three and a half miles from where we were captured. And uh, we spent the night there in an old factory. And the next morning, we, uh, they put us on trucks and took us to Krefeld, um, K-R-E-F-E-L-D. Um, it was at this place that they interrogated some of us, and um, we didn't have any information, and you were instructed to only give your name, rank, and serial number. At that point, uh, tell us your rank. I was a sergeant in, a, in an infantry platoon, and um, uh, so we went uh, to Krefeld, and then they moved us by uh, railroad boxcars for three days. Um, under uh, and we were strafed by our own people because the, the boxcars were not marked, <clears throat> and finally got to a prison camp seven um, um, A. It was a title, was a designation near Hanover. Hanover was a big city. Big city, and um, well, this was I, I've forgotten the name of the city north of there, where the, the village where they had this prison camp, and it was a. Um, it was a sorting area. They, here they separated the privates from the sergeants. The officers had already been separated, and they sent the officers off in one direction, and in my case, there were 12 of us uh, were non-commissioned officers uh, who were put on a train in rather nice accommodations. We didn't know what was going to happen. Beautiful sunny day in December, and they took us with box lunches took us all the way across Germany to Berlin. And that's the second incident that I'd like to share with you. From Berlin, we went to um, 3B, which was at Fürstenberg. That's F-U-R-S-T-E-N-B-U-R-G. That's on the Oder River, right at the Polish border. And uh, we were there until about uh, the early part of January when the Russians attacked and they moved uh, something like 5,000 of us for two, three days and several nights in the ice and snow back south of Berlin to another camp, um, this time just huge tents. And that camp was 3A, and the town there was uh, nearby was Luchenwalde, and that's L-U-C-K-E-N-W-A-L-D-E. -E. And um, after uh, after some time, April the 26th, Marshal Zhukov's army overran the camp. In the meantime, the guards had left to help defend Berlin. And um, with some difficulty, we were able to get back across the Elbe River. And as an interesting side note, I crossed the Elbe River on a pontoon bridge and walk right into the encampment of uh, my, uh, my battalion that I had been with months before and knew some of the people. It was kind of interesting. Uh, if you'd like to circle back and pick up that, um, the, uh, the night we were captured, uh, they'd, we'd been in the dark fighting all through this little farm village and and we got mixed up with some Canadians and another unit from my division and um, some of the fellows hid out in houses and were trying to, to get away from this uh, this panzer panzer of course means tank and they were they were very accomplished uh, experienced soldiers and finally um, the firing stopped the shell fire stopped and uh, a German soldier appeared at the, at the top of this uh, stairs and ordered us to uh, come out. Well, I figured that if I waited, 
uh, you know, the, the number of people in front of me, that maybe they wouldn't come in and look. Well, I decided, I changed my mind after about uh, five minutes. It was so quiet. And uh, I thought, well, I'll just come on out somewhere within sight of the last man going out. And here was this young German soldier that I could see in the light of a flare. And he put his rifle in my stomach and said, um, uh, Hans Hook, which means hands up. And um, Hans Hook, oh yeah, I, was, I have a little German capability. And so, uh, so now by now, the, the other fellows that I'd been captured with were on up the street and then the shell fire started again. And so he pushed me into the nearest house and we went, uh, we were hiding under this big table. And um, all I remember of him at that time was that he was very young. And I was only 19. I learned, or later learned he was 17. And, uh, but he'd already won the Iron Cross. He was a decorated young soldier. And um, so he, when the shelling stopped, we went on up and uh, they collected some more prisoners, some more Canadian prisoners. And because, as I said, this whole area was mined and the tanks couldn't get through. And so they were, they had a field day. You can't fight a tank with a rifle unless you have some special device. So that was the, uh, that was the last I saw him. He, he marched us, he, along with uh, two or three other Soldiers marched just this three and a half miles to Broccolin, and I, it was the end of it. Well, uh, years later, I was working for Coca-Cola International and subsequently with a consulting firm over there and living in Maastricht. And um, on a weekend, uh, I, I was often over there six, seven, eight weeks at a time. On a weekend in November, snowy, cold, um, I called a, uh, a name that I'd been given who was the, if you would, the Franklin Garrett of that area, the his local historian. And um, uh, he, he was a former railroader who had made it his business to learn about all the battles that had been fought in that area during World War II. And so I, I'd been given his name by another of my comrades who wrote this book, another excellent book called Lest We Forget, written by, written by Dan McCullen, who was a retired lawyer and lobbyist in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, he'd given me, he'd, he'd done quite a bit of research, and he'd given me uh, his book and gave me this name, Villy Offerman. W-I-L-L-I -L -L Offerman, O-F-F-E-R-M-A-N. So I called Billy and told him who I was, and he was delighted, spoke excellent English. And I drove over on a Sunday afternoon. It's a very Catholic area, and so they'd all been to Mass and had their schnapps and their, their early dinner. And I, uh, I spent the whole afternoon with him. Had a four-story house and uh, we went up and down the steps because he collected quite a bit. Well, he asked my story, and I told him. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm eclipsing now, but he, he said, I know a German soldier who uh, who's, describes this situation just the way you did. And uh, there were some other exceptional circumstances that take too long to explain, but it was enough to differentiate. It was your 17-year-old? It was. He'd come to, um, uh, Billy had, w did seminars, as does Franklin, or did. And um, he'd done this seminar in Geilenkirchen, and it was advertised or written about in the papers. And my captor, Heinz Beiderweiden, uh, that's H-E-I-N-Z, Beiderweiden, B-E-I-D-E-R-W-I-E-D-E-N, Heinz Beiderweiden, um, a retired banker uh, from Lingen, Germany, but now living in Bad Schwischenan, and that's B-A-D, Schwischenan is, 
Z-W-I-S-C-H-E-N-H-A-M, up on the North Sea. Uh, and so he'd been to the seminar, gave his name to Vili and said, I'd like to know when you do this again. And he, they had time for coffee and a snack, and he told him his story. And that's how Vili put us together. Well, that afternoon, Vili said to me, uh, this is November of 1995, would you like to meet the German soldier I think was in the same situation as you were in? And I didn't believe that could be possible. So I, I said yes. So Billy is a very uh, uh, prompt sort of fellow, and he got on the phone and called Heinz up in Bad Swishenon, and Heinz said he'd be down the next day. Did you remember him? No, no. As a matter of fact, I really didn't believe that this was I mean, factual. So uh, he came down the next day. I, I've got the days wrong. I was over there on a Saturday. It was Sunday after Mass that I went over. And um, as I, it was a cold, spitting snow, another bad day, no one outside. It was about 2 o'clock, and Germans are always on time. And so I, was, I parked the car I was using, and I saw this man coming around the, the corner in a warm-looking navy pea suit, or pea coat, like the navy boys wear. And I walked up to him, because I was sure it was the person. And so I said, are you Heinz Beiderweiden? He said, yeah. He said, du bist Howard Heile? And because uh, his English is, is worse than my German, so we had a. And so we shook hands and went into Willie's house. And to make a long story short, uh, we talked for three hours, and at the, in the last hour, we got in my car, the three of us, and drove over just five miles to Mullendorf, Germany, where I was captured. That's M-U-L-L-E-N-D-O-R-F. And I told Heinz what I remembered of that night's ugliness, and he, no, I did it the other way around. I said, Heinz, tell me what happened. And I, it was clear. And then I told him, and he remembered me and going under the dining room table. And uh, so in January of 96, I was over in Bremen uh, doing some work. And I called him in Bad Swishenon, which is just an hour or so away. And he invited me over, so I spent a, a long weekend with him and uh, his wife, Anna and his two boys, who are about my boys' ages now, 45. What I was wondering, in you view, things were winding up, and I'm wondering if he did when you described the ferocity of the resistance. Did they know that the things were winding down? I don't, I don't believe that he had, um, by his, his by the, 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 the short conversation we had, um, and remember his age, I don't believe he knew how bad off the street. They weren't informed of the way we were. And of course, I had just come over. <clears throat> so I had, I had all fresh information. And um, we used to kid the German guards in prison camp by saying, you know, Hitler kaput, he's finished. And they didn't want to talk about it. It was a serious matter. Well, they didn't believe it for a start, but uh, the um, uh, kaput could mean not only dead, but his reign, his regime is over. And the soldiers I was talking to, these were almost all my captors were uh, German infantry or panzer troops who'd been wounded and were were not well, you know. Yeah. So uh, that's how I got. My second uh, little wound, I, I, we were, when we, they were marching us from Fürstenberg to Luchenwalde in the ice and snow and so forth, they killed one of the American boys because he wouldn't get up. He was sick. And so we, we, we pushed our way to where this was going on, and a German guard swung around and hit me in the mouth and knocked some teeth out. So um, 
That qualified me for a, a second Purple Heart. The, uh, that second event that I brushed was uh, in the Berlin Railway Station. And this is, this is such an unusual story that it's, it, it borders on absolute unbelievability. But we, we pulled into the station just as the bombing started for that evening. It was da daily, twice daily, the British during the night and the Americans during the day. And so this was the time for the British. And as we went down into the Hauptbahnhof, which is the a name for train station in, in Germany, uh, the bombing started and the, the train station, deep underground, was a bomb shelter. Not only that, but there were, there were uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of people milling and going about getting trains to go from here to there. Uh, there were refugees who were working for the Germans, had no choice. There were German soldiers on leave. There were family members. There were people, etc. It was chaos. And when uh, our guard, when the bombing stopped, the trains suddenly all began to move. And uh, our guards, two, with the twelve of us, pushed us in the direction of a what we later learned was a commuter train, connecting with another train. And I wasn't in any hurry. I figured that's his problem. And, uh, and another sergeant was the same attitude. And before we knew it, the 10 got on with the two guards and the doors closed, it was like a subway. And here we were in the middle of downtown Berlin in December of 1944. We looked like the Dickens. We hadn't shaved in days, maybe weeks. We had uh, black triangles painted on our thighs, our, our trousers, and in the middle of our back, as identified as, as prisoners. Uh, we probably were ripe, um, and we had no money. And not, uh, George, uh, the other man, uh, to my knowledge, didn't speak any German. And uh, my German w was simply uh, uh, sparse. So he wanted to get on a train and go west. He was an ex-football player, freshman football player from Georgia Tech. Very big fellow. And he wanted, he said, we'll, we'll escape. And I said, now hang on. The war's about over. We have no money. We don't speak German. We don't have any train tickets. We look like the Dickens. We are Americans. How are we going to get from downtown Berlin back to the front lines? Well, there was some reason in that. And he wasn't always reasonable, but I said, let's go over and sit down. So we went over and sat down on a, uh, a bench. Meantime, people, and uh, he said, okay, uh, what do we do? I said, I think we need to find those guards. Uh, I'm no hero, and I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know what damage we could do without uh, getting killed for a purpose that they wouldn't even know we were here. So about that time, another computer tra commuter train backed into position. The doors opened up. It looked to me like it was going the same direction. We got on the train, and uh, it, was, it was suddenly packed. It was one seat, and George said, you go back and sit in that seat. I'll stand by the door, and every time the doors open up, I'll see if I find the guards. So I went back and sat down right across from a Hitler Jugend. Real angry, 15-year-old, uh, and he looked at me. And the train started up, and he said, "Du bist ein Kriegsgefangener. You are a prisoner of war." And uh, I looked at him like I couldn't understand, and he raised his voice, and 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 punched the man next to him, a civilian or maybe a refugee, and he he didn't want any part of it. And I just kept looking like, I don't know what you're saying. Well, he got so irritated, he got up. And it was a German sergeant, a Feldabel, sitting over here. And he was quite decorated, wound stripes. And he looked like he, he looked badly. So the, the young man, the Hitler Jugend, told him that I was a prisoner of war and looked like I was escaping. And I can't tell it 
tell you exactly what the, ser the sergeant said, but in effect it was, get lost. Well, that irritated the boy no end. And so he... I think it was, it was, wasn't it? Saved my life, probably. And so the, the young kid came back and sat down, and he just glared at me. And about that time, it was pretty quick, I, George was up at, the, up at the front, called my name. Now, we, we didn't want to be recognized. We wanted to do this as quietly. And, uh, but my last name is Heil. Now, it's the Finnish version, H-Y-L-E. Um, but Heil, at the top of his voice, meant everybody in the car turned around and looked at us. And I, I, I didn't run. I didn't want to. But I walked as fast as I could. We got off the train, and here were the two guards and the ten soldiers. And uh, I think it saved our lives. We could, we could have been wandering around in Berlin, and because uh, that was near the end of the war. So there are the two little stories. Oh boy, that was as scary as being in the action, almost. Well, you know, it's it's strange. You, it's like uh, it's it's uh, in. Um, in that circumstance, it was a, a high-speed adventure where you didn't want to make any real mistakes, you know. And uh, I was 19, George was 20. Uh, interestingly enough, back to the Heinz Badervied story, while I was visiting with Heinz in uh, Bad Swishenan, I asked him what he did as a, a business occupation, and he told me that he'd done his apprentice work and had become a uh, banker and worked his way up and ended up managing a bank in Lingen, that's L-I-N-G-E-N, Germany, which is north of Essen, about a couple hours, on the Dutch border. And I had just been in Lingen working for Coca-Cola. I had met the, the owner, Clemens Vandenberg, of a 115-store fast food chain called... Um, Kochlöffel, which means cooking spoon in German. And I said, do you know Clemens Vandenberg? This is in Heinz's house in, in uh, January of 90, what did I say, 96. He said, oh yeah, he said, Clemens was one of my best customers. Hmm. So here is Clemens Vandenberg, who's been a visitor in my home in Atlanta. I'm visiting the soldier who captured me and they were business associates. It's really, really uh, interesting. And I wonder what was going through his mind when y'all were under that table. Yes, I do too. I, I think he was... Whether to shoot me or not? Well, you know, th then I didn't know. Uh, I certainly wasn't going to... Uh, he was smaller than me. But we were surrounded. There were, the, uh, there were, there were German tanks parked down here. and this uh, personnel carrier with a heavy weapon on it and uh, German soldiers milling around. There wasn't a lot you could do. Oh, my. Well, um, when you were in Germany or overseas, did the mail come through? Did you keep in touch with people back in the States? Good, good question. I, I, uh, w they had a system. I hope I'm, they had a system. of uh, mail, and I didn't bring it with me. Um, we were able to write um, um, little letters, which were censored by the Germans. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, during that period of time, from when I was captured November the 22nd, about a month before the Battle of the Bulge, 44. And so uh, from that time, November 22 to like, till the Russians overran us, then it took us some weeks to get out. We were, we were almost worse off with the Russians. Uh, they were drunk a lot and, uh, and uh, quite difficult. But I didn't get any mail. Mm. But my family did, and I thought I brought it with me, a copy of one of my little so missives. Diary, so I, should I ask about that? 
So I didn't. I didn't, didn't keep one. Good luck items. Do you recall the day your service ended? Well, it was November of uh, the first time. It was November of uh, forty-five, and um, um, I uh, I opted. As it turned out, it probably was a mistake as far as I was concerned. But I opted on uh, at that moment of uh, being uh, leaving the army to stay in the reserves. Mm. So I was assigned to the 18th Airborne Corps in reserve, inactive, and um, I remember that day when we lined up and signed the piece of paper. And then the um, next thing I knew was, uh, let's see how to put this together. On June the 25th, the North Koreans overran the 38th parallel. On June the 30th, 1950, I was married in Champaign, Illinois, and one week later, I got an airmail special delivery registered letter to report back to the 11th Airborne. So I was recalled to the 11th Airborne, 187th Regiment, and um, <clears throat> by a set of circumstances that were good for me, I ended up in a staff job and did not go to Korea or, f or fight in that war. At that time, I got out in, again, in November of 1951. And this time, I didn't stay in the reserves. <laughs> I didn't need to ask that one. No. <laughs> did you uh, benefit from the GI Bill? Yes. Yes, I did. I went to, went back to William and Mary, and with a little bit of time that I had accrued at Johns Hopkins, I was able to get through in three years. And then because of, uh, 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 I had a small pension and I, had, I took other tests and qualified <clears throat> for graduate school. So I went back to, went on out to the University of Illinois to do my graduate work. I was for quite a long time. Uh, I, I do belong, <coughs> belong and try to remain active with the XPOWs, very worthwhile group. Uh, uh, their mission is to help those who can't help themselves. And they, they put this out uh, monthly and um, they have annual meetings. Uh, I also belong to the uh, 84th Infantry Division's uh, unit and we, we they have annual meetings, and I've been to a number. They're all getting, I, I read somewhere, there's 1,700 of us dying a day now <clears throat> of, of the, from the different wars. And so these, these conventions are at once uh, uh, exhilarating and full of memories, nostalgic, but also sad because uh, fellows are coming in on crutches and wheelchairs and uh, but it, it is kind of fun to go uh, because you uh, they start telling these war stories and you sometimes wonder if they were even in the same earth as the battle this wasn't the way I remembered it at all you know well you know it's it's less enhancement or changing the facts and more of what this or that soldier saw at that moment and, um, you know, he, he could very well have been uh, five yards away from me and seen a completely different set of circumstances. Um, and that happened, you know. So it's... Uh, I bet you heard some. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, so, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did I tell any of those? Well, I don't think they... <laughs> I remember a, one of the m sergeants that I, I worked with uh, ended up being a postmaster in, uh, in, a, in Lafayette, I believe, Lafayette, Louisiana. And he was interviewed by the local newspaper. And he told his side of, of one of the battles we were in. And I, I remember calling one of my mates and saying, I don't believe he was in the same war. 
you know. He just saw things differently, you know. He didn't dress up his role. He just saw it differently. That's right. Uh, how would you say your service and experiences affect your life? Well, it, um, it was a, um, it was a major uh, change. I was, uh, uh, it was, it was uh, a sudden confrontation with absolute stark reality. Uh, prior to that, I'd been a, a, a one of two sons in a middle-class family in near in Maryland. I was uh, had had very real plans to go on to the seminary and be a priest, an Episcopal priest in those days. I changed later. And um, that whole experience of uh, leaving the cocoon, the home, and, the, and, and suddenly uh, with a lot of wonderful men, um, but under circumstances that I didn't know, changed my whole view. And then when I was called back for Korea, uh, the, um, the, um, the, uh, I had just started to work for the Coca-Cola company and um, I was the only man, and there might have been one other, called back from the company. And um, <clears throat> So it changed my life because all of a sudden I was some I was someone different than the hundreds that worked for the company. So uh, when I came out, I think I got uh, I got to the head of some lists because I uh, I was different. I, you know, I just come back. You were one of the few. How did they know to call you? Why did they? Uh, I was uh, in the reserve, and so I was on a list, and that's how they. Army recalled me, and um, so I was. To the best of my knowledge, there might have been one other fellow who was in the uh, Air Force, and I think it it changed my life. It um, I came back to a different job, in a different opportunity, and uh, I think if I'd stayed under the other circumstances, it would have been more of a plotting opportunity. You know, I think, think that's right. Yes. Yes. Very involved in situations, I can tell. Um, what else do we want to add? Your family now? Excuse me? Your boys have grown up? Yes. Came, uh, I married, uh, married a, 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 a convent educated Catholic girl from the Midwest. And we had four wonderful children, and now have six. I lost her in uh, November of 1999. And um, um, a year or so later, my college sweetheart that I had known for 60 years lost her husband. And we met at a reunion, a college reunion. And um, we were married last December a year ago, and it's been just wonderful. Well, in many ways it will bless us. Yes. Um, I don't know where to ask or leave off. Here's what I'll read you. What did you think of your fellow officers or soldiers? Well, I was very lucky. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I was uh, always with uh, the, the in incredibly talented and uh, and uh, good officers, and uh, given the fact that I'd gone back to college from uh, the training at Fort Benning, and then gone back into an infantry outfit with 3,000 of these same kind of people, um, it was. Uh, it was, uh, these were wonderful companions, comrades, and e even those that were already in the division from Oklahoma, a lot of them from the from West, Midwest, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Montana, 
Uh, these were uh, ranch uh, uh, cattlemen, ranchers, uh, telephone men, and uh, they were first rate, just first rate. I don't, I, to my knowledge, we didn't have any cowards or, or um, I did hear that somebody shot himself to avoid, but I, I didn't know the person. During those circumstances, I don't guess there was much leave time. No, he didn't, did you no. Get leave at all? I got a, um, I got a uh, two week furlough just before we went overseas. And then when we came back, we had, I think it was a 30 day furlough. And then we were sent to uh, Miami, uh, uh, one of these uh, centers, uh, rehab and so forth. And I was uh, on orders to go to Fort Stoneman, California to be shipped over to fight for, in Japan. And luckily, uh, August 1945 occurred thanks to Mr. Truman's decision. Yes. And there were hundreds of thousands of us getting ready to fight in for J take Japan. Did you have to go to California? Uh, no, uh, again, a nice uh, a whole set of circumstances uh, sent me to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, where we were processing returning veterans. Mm -hmm. And it was in that, and I, I was in that job from the end of, uh, the, from VJ Day until November of 45 when I was uh, discharged. It's mm. quite a story. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's what it, somebody said on the radio the other day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, repeat wouldn't, it. Wouldn't want to live through it? No. <laughs> but uh, but, I, but I'm, I'm glad that I did because it's, uh, it's given me a, gave me a whole dimension to my life that uh, it uh, certainly reconnected me, uh, if I needed reconnecting, to uh, religion, to the importance of relationships. Um, and we've, you know, we've, a number of us have kept in touch. So on, on different days that were important to us, I'll get a phone call from somebody that's had a couple of drinks and he wants to talk about old times. That's what it's all about. Isn't yes, it? it is. Communication, old friends, new friends too. And you went on with an executive career. Well, I, I ended up, as I said, with Coca-Cola and then with in, in the, in the domestic business and then um, was fortunate enough to be um, sent over to the international part of the business. And I, I spent from 1978 until I retired in 1989 and then I bought a consulting company and spent most of my time in Europe so I from 78 until I retired 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 uh, <laughs> 1997 and then I went back to work again in 2001 to help a former business associate um, with a company that needed some work but now I'm retired, retired, retired. Well, that's what, was, that's what they say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you came back from overseas, did you know you were going to do so much traveling in civilian life? <laughs> no, but you know, that I'd always wanted, uh, you know, there's a, there's a story about uh, developing a relationship with your captor. And so I found in, uh, in my inter work with International that I felt and I traveled many places. I, I was, I'd never been to Russia but, or, or Romania, Bulgaria, but I touched uh, just a, a lot of places. But I always felt more comfortable in Germany. The, um, and I can't explain it why, except to explain why, but I think it had to do with the fact that we, we shared a pretty bad time together. Yeah. And, uh, and they didn't, uh, I think that's it. I, and then I hear German a lot better than I speak it, so I could get along. And um, but I like the way they work, like the way they are disciplined. Punctuality is a major issue with them. They get sick if they are late for something. 
And a number of our offices, a number of my clients were in, uh, were German or worked in Germany. The, uh, equal, uh, equally, I, I uh, felt very comfortable with the Dutch, uh, the, 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 the Netherlanders. Um, they are, in, to my limited experience, uh, they are still the most appreciative of all the countries that we we liberated or helped liberate. Um, nothing is too much for a Dutch person to, as far as if you're an American, and they do wonderful things. There's there's one huge American cemetery in uh, in Margraten <coughs> near uh, uh, near Maastricht in the in the province of uh, of uh, Limburg, L I M B U R G. And um, I used to live nearby there when I was working over there, and so I got to know the guides who uh, care for that beautiful cemetery. Um, currently, there are 8,000 American boys there. After the war, it was 17,000, but the, um, the, the American government offered families who had sons there, uh, offered to bring them home. So 9,000 were taken out. But those, the, du the Dutch <coughs> are uh, asked and are assigned one grave so that on Memorial Day, every single grave has flowers on it from some Dutch family. It's really quite, quite touching. Uh, I was there one, one cold again, cold day, and I feel like it was February. And I, I have a lot of friends buried there, and so I was, it was a weekend, and I walked out into this beautiful cemetery. I don't know if you've ever been to a military cemetery. The, the Latin crosses and the Stars of David, and that's really all you see. And each of them have the name, the rank, and the day he was killed. And I was standing beside the grave of one of my old friends, I felt a presence, and it was a young man I later learned. His name was Philip Smeet, S-M-E-E-T. -E um, he, he, he asked, could I help you? And I said, no, I think I found the, the boy I wanted to say a prayer over. And make a long story short, he, had, he was beside himself with joy. He would just been told by letter by the Dutch government in cooperation with the graves and registration people from the United States, that he had been a grave to tend. And he had to ride a bicycle for five miles from his home to come over there as often as he did. Yeah. Oh, and so appreciative. I got lost uh, one afternoon uh, coming into, uh, into Amsterdam. I was coming from Germany. Got lost, and I really was lost. I, uh, you, the canals, and you can just get lost. And I pulled in under a uh, service station uh, a, uh, overhang and got a map out. And uh, I was standing there trying to find where I was so I could get where I wanted to be. And a Dutchman came up with his umbrella very proper and they all speak English. They speak many languages. And he said, can I help you? And I said, well, yes, I, I need to get to the Amsterdam uh, Hilton. He said, well, you're quite a ways from there. He said, uh, go in a general direction. Let me go with you. So he got in my car, and it took us a half an hour to find it. And when I finished, when we got there, I said, well, now, where do you live? And he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye, and he said, where are you? I met you. I said, well, I'm going to take you back. He said, no, you'll get lost again. <laughs> but he said, no, there's, a, there's a, a trolley just up the road that takes me right back. But that was very special. He, that was his little bit to help his... Uh, Yes. Yes, they do. Well, 
and I'm. Oh, we. No, I I think that they were the they were the. For another time, there's a whole series of stories having to do with getting uh, out of prison camp, <clears throat> back through the curtain of fire that you go through when you're captured. How did you do that? Well, it was with some difficulty. Uh, the Russians <clears throat> um, literally overran the camp, and there were thousands of us that had been collected from the, from the east. Um, and divided by nationalities, divided by rank, and um, uh, we and uh, things began to deteriorate. There was no food. The Germans were at least organized, you know, and um, so um, uh, we we just had to manage the best we could, and um, we tried several ways of getting out. <clears throat> We'd all made some uh, preparation for being liberated. I'd made a knapsack out of an old tent that had fallen down and a couple of buddies of mine with 101st Airborne and I took off in the direction of Dresden and that didn't work very well. Another day we stole a big dray horse from a German family, a German lady and her French refugee farmer got the horse back to the camp and we're loading him up to figure we'd and the, the uh, Frenchman came over and uh, he was quite agitated and of course made a good point that was that this horse was the only way they were going to live and so we gave me his horse back and there was story after story but we finally finally uh, well a lot of little stories in there, but finally uh, I, I was standing in the middle of the camp, camp and um, some reporters came that had crossed the uh, Elba and said that the negotiations had broken down between the Americans and the Russians over repatriation of, uh, of Russian civilians uh, and Russian, certain Russian soldiers. And that the Russians had said, we will keep all prisoners of war until you give us back who we want. So these reporters said, um, uh, there's a truck column coming fast to take as many of you as they can. And um, I was standing right there. And so um, the colonel in charge by now, some Air Force colonel, said, who knows where Truenbreitzen is? Well, True and Brighton is T-R-E-U-N-B-R-I-T-Z-E-N. And I had just been there the day before, it's about two miles over, to the field, getting some eggs, taking, taking some eggs. And uh, I said, Colonel, I've just been there. Well, I shouldn't have, you weren't supposed to leave the camp because you could have been killed. He said, Sergeant, I'll overlook the fact that you were out of the camp, but lead us. So I took off across the fields and managed to get in the first truck. And there were like 10 trucks. They loaded them up and took off. And I later learned that, the, that hundreds, maybe thousands, were, were uh, kept in that camp for another month while the Russians and the Americans yeah. who were meeting in Halle, H-A-L-L-E, in Germany. And it was a major issue. Some of them were nuclear people. You know, these were people the Russians wanted back. And, uh, and uh, we weren't going to give them back because uh, they had asked for asylum. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, there was a book written on that whole subject. It, uh, I've forgotten the title, but it makes the claim, documented beautifully, that there were 25,000 British, Canadian, American, and others that the Russians had in gulags in um, Russia. In, in, in the United Soviet, the, the, the USSR, that had been uh, captured, uh, some in the Korean War. Uh, there was a fictional book written, and they say it could have happened. Um, um, 
about a, a group of American uh, Air Force pilots that had been pressed into service to teach the Russians how to fly. Oh, no. I shouldn't say that, should I? Well, um, there's, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about it. I, I, I wish I, I can't remember the name of the book, but the, the, it's, uh, it, it lays the claim and then uh, mm. documents it. Uh, and. Um, Supposedly, uh, some of our senior people knew about it, but other negotiations were more serious at that point. Don't know how all that ended, but I do know that I got on that first truck because I overheard this conversation that the negotiations had broken down. So it pays to be up front. Pays to be alert, too. Though. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. That's right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Margaret. It was a, very seldom I have a, an opportunity to just talk without having to listen to. Well, thank you. I wanted to be sure I didn't omit anything, but as you said, there were so many details and facets. Yes. You know, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a wonderful thing. The uh, I'm trying to think what, but in the last year and a half, I've got some insignia on my car. I've had at least three, maybe four. Um, people come up to me in parking lots and say thank you. One time it was out, just out here in Sandy Springs, and this man was standing by my car mid midday, just standing there, leaning on my car. And I wondered why, and I, as I came up, he said, is this your car? I said, yes. He said, were you in the 84th Division? I said, yes. He said, I lost a brother with the 45th. And he said, I just want to say thank you. And walked away. Just very special. And so I do it too. I was in the airports in these last little while when some of the boys are coming back from, from Iraq and Afghanistan. And, uh, and there, <clears throat> there was applause. And people are becoming aware now much yeah. more so than they were earlier. Yes. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Margaret. I'm going to run to that little room down here. Yeah. It's this way.